um, <clears throat> I think it's vital for um, me as a coach to talk about something that isn't so pretty. A lot of times I think we, we, we think that because um, wisdom coaching is something I, I was pretty much committed to, to be in this lifetime, I feel like I have a responsibility to talk about something that many people may not want to discuss. Um, and I actually created a while back a program called the Red Flag Program because I'm a huge advocate for um, just toxic affairs, um, domestic violence, um, just affairs that just are unhealthy. I think it's important that as a coach and as my, a part of my purpose is to talk about what to do in the fact when you're in a toxic affair. I don't say toxic love affair because I think that when we add love to toxicity, when discussing um, domestic violence or when discussing um, toxic love affairs, a lot of times it gets misconstrued that there's love inside of toxic affairs. And I want to be clear that toxic affairs <clears throat> are not of love. And the reason I say that is because I know a lot of times when you're in these affairs, they feel good. Um, and many people that has not really been on the inside of trying to assist and help those in these types of dynamics understand that there is no love there because there's so many people that are in toxic relationships that spend a lot of time trying to make sense of the nonsense <laughs> if that makes any sense but that's what it is and so I wanted to talk this morning about um, why they stay um, there will be a blog that I'm going to be posting called Why They Stay in Toxic Affairs. I think it's important that we understand why a lot of times domestic violent vi victims um, or, you know, murders in love affairs, why this happens is because there's usually a intertwined circumstance that many people don't talk about and I want to talk about that really quick when you're in a toxic love affair uh, let me scratch that toxic affair when you're in a toxic affair there's twofold and two different dynamics that's going on here there's the private affair between the two that are toxic so let me put this up. Let me put you up on game with something. When you're in a toxic affair, a lot of times you are toxic with each other. So what that means is, if you're the one, the one taking the blows or the or taking the physical abuse or taking the verbal abuse, a lot of times you become toxic as well. So what that means is, some people think that the victim that's having the most scars or the victim that you can see the most um, damage physically um, is usually not doing anything to provoke. And a lot of times that's not true. Sometimes there is provoking going on. Sometimes there's, there's people prodding and prodding for them to challenge them to put their hands on them. This is a part of the dynamic that many people don't talk about. You know me. I'm going to talk about the ugly and, you know, what it is. <laughs> and when you're in a toxic relationship, that means both parties in that relationship are both toxic. Together, they cause this toxic bond, okay? So understand that because there's a toxic bond and the person that's taking on the abuse aren't always, like, picture perfect and innocent there are also modes and times when they're provoking that person to do it so we have to be clear about that not condoning let me put this out here i'm not condoning domestic violence but what i'm saying is it's a two-fold situation 
And a lot of times when you're in this situation, there's both of you that basically has this toxicity and this, this um, bond of a toxic affair that has caused both parties in that to become toxic. So, and, and it could be, some people are passive aggressive. So sometimes you can be passive aggressive and you're not, you're claiming not to do stuff to provoke, but you are, you feel what I'm saying? So I just want to put it out here. It's not always the people with the bruises. That's the only one that's toxic. Both parties in this dynamic are toxic. Understand that this is important. I want to get you guys to understand that toxic relationships pulls out the toxicity in both parties, okay? Um, and I also want to talk about why, you know, it's crucial that people in, a, in toxic affairs understands that the only difference between them and the person that got murdered is that they stayed one day too long. So this is why it's important that we understand, and, and understand this too, that even if it's not physical abuse or sexual abuse, it could be verbal abuse. And that is also murdering your self-love, murdering your self-confidence, murder, murdering your, your inner light. So I always say that we, are, we all are a flame inside of our soul we all are born with a flame inside so some of our flames are bright some of our flames are lit but not really where they need to be and other flames are dim so in a toxic affair nine times out of ten the relationship it just it, it what it's doing is it's causing you to be as dim as you can in your light because when you begin to to ignite and get more, you know, beauty or more self-loving, what happens is that partner is trying to keep you and hold you down from that beaming of light. So this is why it's important that we understand why someone stays in this dynamic and why once they leave, they go back. Why, 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 right? And see, because I've had so much on hand situations in my personal life. I have not, thank God, been a victim of this. But I have been a go-to person that for people that have gone through this. One of the hardest parts about it is the person that's in it does not realize that mentally they are not stable. They are not healthy. They are not okay. So when you go through a toxic relationship, abuse as the abuser or as the person being abused, you are not well. So even after you leave that relationship, there still needs healing. There still needs things done. Because even though you physically leave, inside you may still be in turmoil trying to think, well, should I go back? Should I go back? If he calls, if she calls, what do I do? You're going through a lot because <clears throat> that toxic affair has been such a huge um, cyclone in your life that it's hard for you to pull out of it, even when you physically leave. So here's the other problem that I see a lot of times in these particular dynamics is once you leave or once you tell everybody, listen, I'm being in, a, I'm in an abusive relationship. We're fighting. We're fussing. We're going back and forth. We can't, we can't work this out. And people come to your aid, say it's family, say it's friends, you know, say it's co-workers, whatever. People come to your aid and help to pull you out of that circumstance, right? A lot of times people that are doing that, they're doing it feeling to, it, with a feeling of trying to help you, okay? Problem is when you, when you do this as somebody that's a huge advocate of it, I understand that even if I pull you out of the circumstance and get you to safety, that nine times out of ten, you're going to go back. It's what it is. But people who, who don't have the knowledge of that, and they're in the middle of it, and they're trying to help someone else, they're just doing it because they're trying to save you. You feel what I'm saying? Out of the goodness of their heart. They're trying to save you from being murdered, being killed, being abused again. So their understanding is, I'm going to take them out, 
they're going to be safe and they're going to be good and I've done my part. That's all well and fine. However, in reality, that's not how it works. A lot of times in domestic violence circumstances and situations, people go back. And when they go back, it gets worse. So now when they go back, the person that's helped or the family members that has aided you and got you into a better circumstances, a lot of times those family members get really upset. They get really angry that I took my time out of my day to help you and bring you out of that drama and headache. And you took your behind back over there. Don't ask for help again. Don't help. I'm not helping you no more. Right. I, I don't I don't feel like I'm going to uh, waste my time is what family members or friends or support supporters start to do. They start to turn in their back on you because now you're not even caring about yourself more than I'm caring about you and I'm done. OK, but the problem of this is what happens is when we do this is we call it cost us. It costs the victim more hell. Because now when they go back, we understand as advocates that when they go back, that situation's worse. So when they go back, because they went back, the aggravation, agitation, um, I guess the complete and total disappointment that the supporters had in your ability to stay away becomes very um, overwhelming. And then the supporters are like, not helping you. I, I'm good. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to do any more for you because you're just going to end up going back. And what that does is that costs the person that's in that more harm than not. Not to say I don't understand why people get frustrated or why people pull out of supporting, but understand that when you pull out and you're not in your response time to their holler or to their scream or to their request for help. When you are slow to, re to, to move, this is when they're a higher risk for murder. This is when they're a higher risk for being hurt, harmed, even worse than the first time. This is why this people stay. You see what I'm saying? I don't think under, I don't think a lot of people understand why people stay in the dynamics they're in. They stay because they, they're not mentally well.